Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Rebecca McNamara. I use she, her pronouns, and I am associate curator at the Francis Young Tang Teaching Museum and Art Gallery at Skidmore College. I am currently also a 2023 Lenore G. Tawney Fellow at the John Michael Kohler Art Center, as well as a member of the Surface Design Association's Exhibitions Committee. Before we get started today, I have just a few announcements. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, the Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. On behalf of the organizers, we are honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming. This is a webinar format, so your screens and mics are not active or showing. Please ask questions anytime. And if I don't get to your question during the presentation, just know that I'll um, be saving about 20 minutes at the end for, for some Q&A. There are three primary ways to engage. You can use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen for questions. You can use the chat box for greeting others. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. So we respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with participants. And lastly, the survey is for commentary or ways we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. I want to thank Astrid from Service Design Association, who's in the background helping with tech and monitoring the Q&A for this program. And of course, um, Lucy as well. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I'm honored to speak with you all today about the art of Paula Wilson. I've been fortunate to get to know Paula closely over the last few years as we prepared for her current exhibition at the Tang. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to the Tang before, again, that's the Academic Museum on Skidmore College's campus in Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. Paula Wilson, Toward the Sky's Back Door, opened in July and runs through December 30th. So if you are in the upstate New York area or you want to be, the museum is free and fall is a really great time for a visit. And I'm especially pleased to share that the exhibition will also travel. It will go to the California African American Museum in Los Angeles and their iteration will run April 3rd through August 18th of 2024. As a curator at a teaching museum, I've been giving a lot of tours of Paula's show to the local community, as well as to Skidmore undergraduate classes across disciplines. One of the many things I love about Paula's work is that it offers entry points for so many people and it rewards repeated viewing. And even now, after having organized the exhibition and having worked closely with Paula, there are details or interpretations of the works on view that students will point out to me that I hadn't noticed or hadn't thought of in that particular way um, that they're referencing, which is always really exciting. But it also makes it hard to distill her work into a single conversation like this one. Um, so for today, I'll, I'll be focusing on the textile-based aspects of her practice. Uh, but because Paula's work encompasses so many different media and techniques, painting, printmaking, sculpture, collaborations with her woodworker husband, Mike Lag, video performance, collage, and more, uh, just know that there will be a lot of a lot of things still left to explore after today's hour is over. Paula brings joy and jest to her practice in a way that feels very unique to her. Um, and there are many stories hidden in the details of her works. So my presentation today is titled Made with a Wink because that is one way I think of the puns and humor that viewers uncover through close looking. There are many serious, urgent topics in the work. Uh, Paula addresses her own human experiences, how we engage with one another and with non-human beings around us, her identity as a Black biracial woman, her relationship with the desert land around her, with how we engage with art and art histories, with storytelling, experiencing ways for an artist to live and work outside the crush of mainstream life, 
Um, but throughout, Paula comes through to wink at us, to play, to remind us that moments of joy and love can and should permeate each day. So to allow her to describe this idea in her own words, I have a quote on the screen. She says, I think that we are tasked on this earth to celebrate our lives. For me, working and making art opens the floodgates to this calling. So Paula is now perhaps best associated with her life in the rural town of Carrizozo, New Mexico, and her connection to the desert landscape. But she spent her childhood and young adult years in cities. She was born and raised in Chicago. She went to Washington University in St. Louis, where she received her BFA in 1998. She continued to make art, including self-funded public art projects in Chicago and Brooklyn. In 2005, she received her MFA from Columbia University in New York, and she was working as a studio assistant for Kara Walker, continuing to make her own art in New York City in the subsequent years, when she decided to take a leap of faith and love and move to that small desert town in New Mexico. So in 2007, Paula moved to Carrizozo to be with her now husband, Mike Lai, who's pictured on screen there as they cross the railroad tracks. This is part of their pathway from their half mile journey from their home to their studio spaces in the downtown area. Um, the downtown area is very small, it's a couple blocks with some buildings there. Um, it's a town of about 940 people uh, and completely unlike the dense cityscapes that, that Paula had lived in previously and completely unlike the northern climate she was most accustomed to. But it was here that she de developed the kind of life that is not possible for most people living elsewhere. Her life and art merged and became deeply intertwined. On screen is a video still from one of her works uh, showing the kitchen cabinets that she hand painted. And there's also that wooden drawer pull that looks to be made by Mike. And this is just a small glimpse inside of Paula and Mike's home. Their creative work reverberates all around them, never confined to a gallery or even to a studio wall. So it is an art for living and a life that is filled with art in all spaces. This view of their studio spaces further exemplifies this approach to living. There's figurative painting on the exterior of buildings. You can see a little glimpse of that at the building to the left. And there's sculptures that are hanging off the walls and kind of weaving themselves into the tree branches. And although Paul and Mike live in this small desert town, they are not alone there. They developed community building projects in Carrizozo. Every Friday from noon to 1 p.m., Paula and Mike offer an art making activity for anyone who wants to drop by, which they've cheekily dubbed MoMA Zozo, a play on the Museum of Modern Art acronym and their adopted hometown name. And so along with others, they also created a residency program in town that offers studio and living space to artists who may also feel inspired by this place or who simply need time away from their daily lives to focus on art making. And since 2016, there have been over 50 artists who have participated in this program. And here's a photo of Paula after she's pulled a bunch of pieces of paintings and prints that she keeps in the flat files in her studio. To create the collage elements in her work, she cuts up pieces that she had discarded of her own work. Um, so she's always retaining her own hand in those collage elements. And this approach of reuse is one of sustainability in a way, but it also reflects the idea that there is value in everything she makes. And so if she creates something and doesn't like it or it's not headed in the right direction, she'll still save it and find um, a moment for it later. So each piece of creativity that she produces can eventually find its use and place in the world. And another image of Paula in her studio, and she's wearing a dress that she printed. She's wearing a belt and earrings that Mike made for her. She's standing on a painting that is made to look like both a mosaic floor and a rug. And we'll look a little bit more closely at that shortly. And this image for me characterizes some of the ways in which Paula has created a life that is an artwork. 
Importantly for today's talk, it also brings together multiple ways that she engages with textiles, both materially and conceptually. Paula's interest in textiles began in earnest when she was invited to do a residency at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in Philadelphia in 2010. On screen, you can see three large works uh, that are currently on view at the Tang from that 2010 residency project. When she arrived at the Fabric Workshop, um, she wasn't at that time really using textiles in her practice. She was primarily working on paper as well as um, sometimes canvas, which is of course a, a textile, but in a different way. Um, and when she arrived at the workshop, there was leftover industrial felt material uh, from the previous resident named Tristan Lowe. So it was already part of Paula's practice at that time to use scraps and leftover materials in her work. And she started to play around with this felt that was kind of hanging around the studio space. Here's an overview image of one of those works, which is called Between Two. The largest, it's the largest of the three works that's on view at the Tang. So throughout her work, Paula mixes many techniques and materials. She layers them together and she does so in this intuitive way, using whatever is at her disposal, whatever will serve the work at any given moment. Determining the full list of materials and techniques of a artwork can feel a bit like an excavation. Um, there's a will be a little bit of fabric and stitching here, a little bit of fabric applied using an adhesive uh, glue material over there. There's printing with multiple different printmaking techniques, block printing, screen printing, monotype, all sorts of things, um, painting in another area. So it's the work is truly multimedia. And this quality offers a surprising physical depth to the work so that even when you're looking at something like this that's ostensibly flat against a wall, it really creates the sense for the viewer that you're being fully encompassed by the work and its narratives. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, one of the goals for this group of works, um, which are clearly meant to resemble the exteriors of buildings, was to address the living quality of buildings that Paula was seeing in Philadelphia, the aliveness of structures that we pass by each day. We often think of brick city buildings as heavy and stagnant, human made, meant to be built and remain unchanged. Um, but Paula recognized in the structures that they were alive with layers of story and energy. So you can see in some of the details I'll flip, flip through, there are posters that are pasted up and then they are torn down or they are covered with new ones. There's graffiti that comes and goes from buildings. There are windows with, which offer us these glimpses into the exterior lives of um, of the people living um, behind the glass. There are weeds that begin to kind of creep up out of the sidewalk, nature finding its way to have a voice amongst the building, making its presence known, sometimes even altering a structure that is built to overpower it. And this is also a good detail to pause on to point out something that you'll hopefully notice recurring through some of these Tang exhibition photos, which is this printed muslin along the floor. Um, so if you see that black, white, gray print that's made to look like wood, that's uh, Paula's, she created yardage of that on muslin um, and sent it to the Tang to include in the show. Um, and it's an, it's an example of, of her way of seeing possibilities where others see nothing at all. Paula had done a site visit at the museum and noticed we have this six inch recess along the gallery walls and kind of asked me about it. It's like, oh, don't worry. It's just like this black hole. Nobody, nobody notices it. it. It doesn't affect the way we hang the work, you know, no problem. But she saw it as a space of possibility. And a few months later, 
emailed me and said, oh, I have an idea for that recess. And it's like an idea. We don't hang art in the recess. It's just, you know, part of the architecture, part of the floor. Um, but she saw it as a place for art. And, and in doing so, and, and in installing this print all along the lower edge of the gallery, it became another aha moment for visitors who don't always notice it right away. Um, but when they do, you kind of realize, oh, it was here all along and I just hadn't seen it yet. Um, and it also, I think, does an interesting thing of kind of confusing the boundaries of where an artwork starts or stops. The perspective here is a good example, the perspective of how we're seeing something, the indoor outdoor vantage points of an artwork that otherwise would have had clear delineations. And something that runs throughout Paula's work is this notion of blurring and confusing boundaries, sometimes, you know, expanding things. And um, this is just kind of another example of that. So Paula constructed these works at the Fabric Workshop after she had studied um, both in books and in walking around the city, the architecture in Philadelphia. But of course, she added her own twist on it. So the architectural ornament at the top of this particular work uh, depicts bums across the frieze. And I've only spent some time in Philadelphia, not a lot, but I never saw a butt like this on a building. Uh, and it's a motif that Paula uses throughout her work. So she recognizes the butt as something ubiqu ubiquitous. So something that all humans, we all have one. And you can't necessarily identify a person's gender or race by seeing their butt. They have this universalizing quality that really appeals to Paula. And they're funny. Butts are funny. Um, there's something about that word, butt, or the image of a butt that even for the most mature among us can bring out a giggle or a sly smile. And that's something that I really love um, when I'm giving tours of this gallery space, especially to students from outside of art disciplines who might be nervous talking in a museum, might worry, be worried that they're going to say the wrong thing, even though I tell them there's no wrong answers. Um, or they just don't really know how to talk about art yet um, or what to look for when looking at art. And once I ask, like, if anyone noticed how many butts are around them, you know, people laugh and giggle, their shoulders relax. And, and we all kind of realize the museum is definitely a space for serious inquiry, but it's also a space where you can play and laugh and have fun with your friends. And um, I think that throughout her work that's something that Paula really offers to us offers that space for play in such an important way um and she has said that celebration and play are what we are tasked to do while on this earth and and those characteristics are central to her art and her everyday living and then through art she's able to to spread those ideas the pigeon is another recurring motif in Paula's work. Um, something that I learned working with her, spending time in this exhibition, is the value of looking in unexpected places. So in the exhibition, physically, a visitor needs to kind of crane their neck upward in multiple places, multiple directions, um, to, or to look down, to even sometimes crouch down, to physically move through the space in ways that we're not necessarily accustomed to in a museum. Contemporary art is typically placed at kind of an average eye level height. You don't usually need to move your neck around when you're in a museum. And so making a stroll through a gallery is a convenient experience for the eyes and neck. But Paula challenges us to move differently and by extension to see differently. And hopefully the work encourages us to take that movement, that looking in unexpected places, that slowing down, that pausing out into the world. And I'll say for me, I had never really spent much time thinking about pigeons. Um, I never liked them. I never didn't like them. I felt a lot of ambivalence toward them. I certainly would have shooed them away if they were on the sidewalk near me. But Paula takes the time to see beauty in things that so many of us ignore or disregard. And when you look at a pigeon, if you pause to look at it the way you might instinctually look at something like a blue jay or a robin, 
you'll notice that they're quite beautiful. Um, many have an iridescent quality to them and that is really unlike other creatures. And here in this uh, video still from another of Paula's works, um, you can see there's this like purple and greenish iridescent quality at that one pigeon on the right. And it's kind of this like technicolor in nature um, that's on a creature that, you know, we, in society are trained to treat like a pest or a nuisance, something commonplace, rather than a living being that offers aesthetic delight. And so as part of the fabric workshop project, Paula painted and silk screened pigeons on felt and a silk satiny kind of material. And uh, so in addition to those that are embedded in the artworks, um, we strategically, the larger artworks, I mean, we strategically placed five pigeons around the gallery. And um, it was a really fun thing to do to walk around the gallery and to say like, if there were pigeons in here, where would they land? And so we placed them in these, in these spots where we thought they might land. So if you haven't spotted it yet, there are two, uh, what we're playfully calling love pigeons in the window, they, as if they've landed on the windowsill so one row or one row up from the bottom and one column in from the right you'll spot those two pigeons um that certainly do trick people sometimes wondering what's going on in the museum and you can also see from this image this um faux stained glass work which is titled first story is hung quite high. It's about uh, 15 to 17 feet off the ground on that lower edge. So again, that comment I made earlier about the ways in which one cranes their neck in this um, gallery space to see art and that looking in unusual places to make sure that you're, you're seeing all that the show has to offer. The original installation at Fabric Workshop, so as part of that residency, um, Paula was given a, a solo show in 2010 there, also called First Story. And so this is the original installation of that piece, which included this extra um, material, this brick fabric below, and it was hung much lower, the, the ceilings were lower there. And you can also, so this is the reverse image of that. So you can see it was it was hung in space and the windows of Paula's work um, mimic the windows of the Fabric Workshop Museum architecture. So if you look in the background of this photograph, you'll see um, the, the building's windows there offering those same shapes. And it's a, so it's a two-sided work and there are clear delineations for interior and exterior sides. So just like with real stained glass where the colors are most vibrant when you're inside of a church or cathedral, the same is true um, in the way Paula created um, this particular work. And so there are moments of her balancing the practicalities and realities of life within her art. So rather than remove something or not include in her art something that um, people don't necessarily like in daily life, she embraces it and acknowledges it. And this is a, another example. So uh, if there was a drain spout on a building, it would expunge water and it would be murky and muddy mess that it would leave below. Um, and so rather than pretend a spout wouldn't exist, she created a spout on her work. And then um, created the the kind of stain that it that it might result in in real life and so um again just acknowledging and playing with with the realities of of living um and here it, it isn't necessarily that it's an unsightly mess it's it's about the humor of it all, I think. And, and maybe it's also something that we can actually find aesthetic interest in. So sort of like the pigeons, is there aesthetic interest in this other thing that we treat as a nuisance in our lives and bring that lightness into daily life? And here's just a closer look, a really great detail of the work. And you can see all those hand stitches around the bricks in this detail as well. And the, the you can see the structure of that 
the spout and the thickness of this industrial felt material that she was using for this work. And then of course the bluish, greenish, yellowish drain excess below. So for the Tang iteration, um, we knew we were not going to use the, the um, additional brick fabric below it, um, but it was really important for Paula to still acknowledge that drain spout because whether it's real or imagined, water would come from a drain spout and it would need a place to go. So she used a picture that she had taken uh, from the drain hole outside of Emerson Dorsch, her Miami gallery. And we had it printed on this kind of textured matte wallpaper sample, which gave it a little bit of a rougher quality that helped to enhance the trompe effect. And we adhered it to the tank floor. And so one of the aspects that I really love about this gesture is that it, it's another of these details that visitors don't always notice right away. And, and that's in part because they're so distracted by looking up at this amazing artwork um, 15 feet above them, um, but you don't see it and it becomes something that you can find either on your way out of the space or maybe during a second visit. And so it's something that ensures there's also always more moments of humor and lightness to discover. This is bricked out also from the 2010 body of work that's now on view at the Tang. So a reminder that these were created only a couple years after Paula had uprooted her lifetime of city living for the rural desert. And she was uncertain what that would mean for her emerging art career. Um, it must have been very scary to be an active artist with connections in New York City and to leave all that behind, but know that art was your passion and your profession and what you wanted to do in life. Um, and she, so she was moving away from this space that, you know, the art world often says, this is where artists should be. Um, and going to a place that was very much off the radar of, of the larger contemporary art world. Um, but she could have this different kind of life there where creating art could be a primary focus of each day and where she could be with the person that she had fallen in love with. So when I see this image, I think not only of that moment in her life, but of the transitional moments in all of our lives. Paula regularly uses the image of her face and body in her work, but doesn't necessarily think of them all as self-portraits in a traditional sense. So there's space for others to see themselves in her too. This figure is perhaps looking ahead or perhaps, in, or in addition, is looking back. And so maybe it depends on who is seeing her or where you are in your own lives when you do see her. But this notion of two seemingly oppositional ideas being true at once, looking ahead while looking back, is a frequent theme throughout Paula's work, both in conceptual ways like this one, but also in material ways. And even here, another detail from Bricked Out, the soft felt and canvas represent brick and plaster and other hard materials. So the leaves are stitched on and from a distance, they appear to be completely regularized, but then on, upon closer look, you really see that handwork of this stitching and, and the embrace of the unevenness and imperfection, which becomes visible. The painting of tree leaves directly on this white faux brick of the building is an example of human made and nature physically merging to become one. And yet all of these kind of conflicting ideas are, are really reconciling together in, in the work. So following the fabric workshop residency, Paula became increasingly invested in ways that she can incorporate textiles into the kind of art making that she at that time had primarily been doing, as I mentioned on paper and a bit on, and on canvas as well. And so I wanna to return to this image um, of Paula and the, I forgot to mention earlier, the work behind her is called Yucca Rising, and that's about a 16 foot high artwork um, in which she painted and printed and drew on muslin and other fabric. And um, the two other main aspects of this photograph that I want to address are the rug that she stands on and then the clothes that she's wearing. 
Paula began making these rugs, um, and I say rugs a little bit in air quotes, but I don't really mean it that way. Um, she began making them in part because she and Mike felt like they couldn't afford the types of rugs that they wanted to have in their home. So she took the tradition of painting on canvas and then applied that canvas to not stretcher bars, which is of course the traditional thing to do and something that she never does anyway. Um, but it, instead adhered it to wooden slats and then placed that on the ground. Um, so every mosaic square and every shadow of those mosaics that you see here are painted. It's a shockingly flat work because it has so much visual depth. Um, and even that outlet plug. So if you look in the upper left uh, corner, you'll see a little tiny outlet plug right here and even that which looks incredibly realistic especially when it's hanging on a wall um, is painted and it's just a really great example of that trembloy or trick of the eye effect that Paula executes so masterfully. So of this very simple yet unconventional act of creating work for the floor to serve as rugs she says quote it's important to create the things that you want to see and have in the world. But what she has done goes beyond creating beauty for her own life. So in the space of the museum, these rugs address multiple histories of women, of textiles, of painting, of how and when art is defined and by whom, of socioeconomic class, of the distinctions between art for viewing and art for function. And so it was really important for the show that we have a rug that visitors could physically engage with, could walk on, could sit on, um, could interact with below their feet, which is of course another unusual way of experiencing art in the museum. So Paula created Yucca Rug, which is the one that you see two students sitting on in this photograph, specifically for the Tang exhibition, knowing that it would be walked on by thousands of people, knowing that it was an artwork that perhaps wouldn't last 500 years or a thousand years because it would be lived with, it would be physically experienced by many people. But if the goal was that it would exist forever and then people couldn't walk on it, it would be like the work was never fully complete. So here's an overview shot of that rug. The lowest layer is painted, the tassels are painted, and then Paula uses a block print of a yucca plant, which is a plant common in her area of New Mexico as the repeating motif. So for this rug, she is also reflecting that format often seen in woven rugs, where a single motif is repeated throughout the design. The flipped over corner is common in many of her rug works, teasing the viewer to imagine both what's on the surface and what's below and where the distinction lies. And because the work is a painting and a print rather than a textile, we had some concern about how visitors would know they could actually stand and sit on it. We usually don't stand on paintings. So the 10 guides who monitor and give tours in the exhibition would be inviting people verbally to, to engage with the work in that way. And there would be a note on the wall label, of course. Um, but Paula also wanted to make her own sign and one that shows people walking on that very rug. And so that is also, um, it looks very dimensional in the image, but that's also flat painted uh, image there. And so this brings a lot of joy and, and life to the space. Um, but as with other areas of Paula's work, with the joy being ever present, the meanings and references are quite deep and varied. And when I walk through this exhibition with classes or community visitors, I always walk right across the rug to show before I even say anything about it, that that's how one is meant to engage with the work. And so people see me do this. And um, sometimes they startle thinking, I don't realize what I've just done. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. Um, but I explained that the artist wants us to walk on the rug to experience the art in this unusual way. Uh, and yet it's so interesting. People still tend to kind of circle around it. I've actually seen people tap the edge of their shoe on it as if like dipping a toe in a cool pool of water. Um, 
And I keep asking, like, why do people respond this way? Is it because it's in a museum? Would they react the same way if walking across a rug like this in Paula's living room? Um, is it because it looks like a painting rather than being made out of fibers? So there's the history of floor work, sculptural, textile-based and painting um, throughout 20th, the late 20th century um, in art history, uh, which is not the focus of the talk today, but I do wanna acknowledge that there are some precedents for things like this. Um, and sometimes visitors are allowed to step on other works and sometimes they are definitely not meant to do that. Um, but for Paula, this rug is about challenging museum conventions, but it's also very much about bringing domesticity, the comforts and the aesthetics of home into the museum space. Paula says of the way in which art made with different materials or for different purposes um, around this topic, quote, there's a real desire for me to collapse the distinction between what's functional, what's high art or what's low art. And I always hesitate to use those labels, but they are important to note because these terms of high and low have defined how painting and marble or bronze sculptures have been valued and embraced by museums and worthy of high price tags versus how often things like textile based work and other types of art that have been considered women's work um, are treated as things primarily for the home, often expected to be made with the free labor of women. And so by making a rug that is a painting, that is also a print, which is another art form that has not always been accepted in fine art museums, Paula conflates and confuses all of these boundaries in really important ways and their connotations with gender and class and economics. And in doing so, she creates this new kind of domesticity, a new kind of art for function, one that can exist in both the home and in the museum, dissipating those art life distinctions. In the Desert Mooning is a print from the Tang collections. So this is all um, a print that's been adhered to these wood slats. And you can see another way in which she showcases these rugs where they're vertical freestanding. Um, as, and become like this sculpture in the round. And the imagery is reflecting more of Paula's both and approach to interpretations that embraces that messiness and contradiction. Um, so regarding that central motif, she says it is, quote, a nod to humanity and to how we're possibly traipsing through and destroying our world. And then we're these amazing creatures that are shining in the environment as well. And so like Paula's kitchen cabinets and these rugs, most of the clothes that she wears bear her own mark as well. So here she is during the installation of the Tang exhibition, starting to print the site specific wall mural called Sky Frame. She's wearing leggings patterned with her mooning fabric and a top that she's created. Paula sometimes works with a seamstress to make dresses, jumpsuits, pants, and shirts, or she'll thrift items that don't have labels or other markings on them um, to create her own clothing, often through block printing directly on the fabric. And she is said of this impulse to create her own clothing, quote, it's been important for me to wear my artwork, to be a walking painting to alter our expectations of where and how art exists in our world. And here's an image from her studio a few years ago where you can see a clothing rack of um, garments that she's worked on. You can also see some things drying. You can see a rug standing on horizontal edge. This image is from an exhibition of Paula Wilson and artist Ashley Bryan, which was held at the Colby Museum of Art earlier this year. And it included a section of Paula's clothing, which was kind of humorous to me to see because I mean, she's wearing this clothing every day um, in her life. And so I was curious about the outfits that were kind of missing from her closet for a stretch of time. Um, and the last main artwork I want to talk about is, is one that you've seen in the background of some of those exhibition photos, which is a monumental 23 foot high cosmic figure that is kind of a compendium of all of the many techniques and motifs and colors 
um, used throughout Paula's practice. So I'm going to play a video of it being installed. And here's the final look at it. The work is called The Skies Remains. It's her largest work to date. It was made specifically for the Tang Gallery's slanted ceiling. Um, and it's a favorite work of mine to have conversations uh, with students in front of because I often start by just asking them to point out what they're seeing. And inevitably, as I mentioned earlier, somebody will spot something that I hadn't noticed before, despite how much time I've actually spent um, with this work. So I want to just flip through a few details here. This is a great detail, it's really high up, but a lot of people are able to spot it. It's a spider kind of swinging from its web and there's that crescent moon motif that we see um, throughout a lot of Paula's work. It was referenced in the um, standing rug that I showed a few slides ago. And that circular um, form also relates to a, a swing that's, in, that's elsewhere in the gallery. Here's a claw foot leg with these pointy collage fingernails grabbing this like sky orb um, above this mound of moths, the moth being another frequent motif in the, in the work. There are collage steps with this side edge that's done in neutrals that creates this kind of sculptural de depth and then the color pieces giving this kind of more traditional perspectival depth. And you may have noticed that a side character of that time-lapse video I showed was the edges of this swing that was kind of moving around the gallery a bit. Um, Paula has two swings in her studio space and offering the opportunity to physically experience play as part of one's museum visit became important in our conversations early on. And so being on a swing all provides play to, to museum visitors. Um, but it also provides an alternate physical perspective for viewing art. So we sometimes walk in front of an artwork, maybe we'll move forward and backwards, but when do we ever get to be on a pendulum swinging in air looking at art? And the last physical interactive element I want to mention um, today is, is related to the sky's remains. Um, so you'll see a, a mobile above it and um, the figure is holding a scissors and there's a thread that's running from the mobile to the wall and then down in between those scissors. And so at the bottom of that thread is a wooden handle and you can actually pull that wooden handle which will help the, the mobiles, um, or the, sorry, the winged creatures uh, wings to, to flap in this really like awe-inspiring, um, moment for visitors and, and just another example of an unconventional engagement in the museum. Um, so that brings me to the end of my slides, but of course there's lots more to discuss. So I'll take my screen share off and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Uh, so there's a question about the yucca rug. Did she block print that? Yes. So to do that, it was um, a similar <clears throat> print that she used actually with um, the sky frame mural in the back. Um, she uses um, pieces of wood and then adheres to them uh, just this kind of foam material that has um, a, a sticky side. So you you know, take the paper off and the foam is sticky. And so that way she can cut directly into the foam. And that was how she created the uh, relief print for Yucca Rug. Um, 
there are a couple of questions about the stained glass piece from Fabric Workshop. Um, and of course, I'm calling it a stained glass piece, but it's it's not, it's fabric. <laughs> it's um, a kind of um, like, um, how do I want to say this? Like a silky and gauzy materials that she was using for that. And I can share these two. I'm going to just do another. Um, see if I can just share this one image again so that you can um, see it again. Yeah, so this is the side that's meant to look like, um, you know, because it has the drain spout, the exterior, and then here's the other side. So there are, Sorry, going the wrong way. Um, so they are these mirror images of one another. And the structural part is all that industrial felt. This ornamentation um, is a separate piece. It's actually hung Velcroed on there. Any other questions? If you have any, please add to the Q&A box. Um, doesn't look like there's any more questions. I'll show, um, just since we have, some time. Uh, I'm going to actually just show one more thing um, that I think everyone will like seeing. Um, okay, here it is. So this wall of um, artwork at the salon hang of works here is actually um, another example of, of Paula challenging museum conventions and also playing with um, that trompe effect. So when you get up close, and here's the detail of just one of those many works, you can see that these aren't actually framed artworks on the walls. So what she's done is she's taken small paintings, sometimes sketches, and framed, quote, framed them with this wooden block print that she uses. And then, um, paints a fake shadow directly onto the wall. And then these work, so the, the printed frame and the painting or whatever print is the central image are attached together. And then together they're ironed directly onto the wall. So they're completely flat against the wall and it creates this amazing um, effect from, from far away. Um, I see we have a couple questions. Um, somebody, Donna asks, with so much physical interaction with some of the pieces, how often do they get damaged? And if they do, does she fix them or just see them as part of the life of her art? Uh, so we haven't had any damage at the museum. So everybody finds some wood to knock on. Um, it's a it's a risk. So I can't speak to, her, to how she personally feels about it, but I would say it's a you yucca rug I mean we had conversations about salty snowy boots in Saratoga traipsing through that and she's very much aware of of what that means um so hopefully everybody interacts with things respectfully like in terms of the winged mobile and the swing and um you know we have guides in the gallery to, to assist with that, to make sure everybody is being respectful of the work. Um, and yeah, that's, and it's, it's just the risk that uh, one takes when having this kind of interactive work. There's a question about, does she use acrylic on the fabric or gel? That I don't know, that I don't have the answer to, unfortunately. Um, there's a question about, does she dye her own fabric? She mostly paints and prints on the, on the fabric. So often using thrifted items. We did a um, program at the Tang with her actually. And um, 
one of the interns was tasked with finding like 50 thrifted shirts um, so that we could make sure to not be buying new shirts for, for what our visitors were going to be printmaking on um, in relation to her work, um, which was really fun to, to do. Um, there's a question um, about how the sky piece, the, oh, so the skies remains that large monumental work, how that's attached to the wall. It's a great question. So you saw that 16 foot high yucca rising figure, um, which is how she was making her figures for a long time. For the Tang one, um, she wanted to come up with a new construction method and, and cut these large squares of cam canvas. And each has, um, I forget if it's two or three grommets on the top edge. And so there are screws in the wall and then the grommets, the grommeted pieces go on top of the screws. So they all kind of hang in a nice um, line like that. And that also helps to keep them pretty um, close to the wall. So there's no, there's no like, D rings or hanging hardware or anything on the back. It's all through those grommets. And then whatever piece is above, the row above covers the grommets from the row below. So there's actually quite a bit of canvas that's not visible when you're in the gallery space. Um, there's a question about techniques or materials that Paul envisions adding to her repertoire. Um, I don't know. She does so, so many already. I know she recently had um, uh, she did a print residency uh, at Wingate in New Hampshire and was doing some uh, printmaking techniques she doesn't usually utilize. And she seems to be doing more and more collaborative work with Mike and his woodworking practice as well. So I'm excited to see kind of where that um, collaboration takes them. Uh, how much 3D or sculptural work does she do in comparison to her flat work, or is it all considered sculptural? Uh, Paula mostly is working pretty, um, I don't, flat's a hard word to say because it is, it is sculptural both physically and um, visually, but um, there are the swing is a sculpture. So the swing is a collaboration between her and Mike. It's called the full circle swing. And so that is certainly considered a sculpture. And then there's one other sculpture, traditional sculpture in the gallery space, which is uh, called Micro House. I showed a small video clip from it. It's um, uh, a multimedia sculpture that uh, is almost like a dollhouse of a, of a home that's combines real and imagined effects of, of place, places where they've lived in, in Carrizozo. Um, and I, I think, you know, the way Paula works is she just sort of responds to the needs of the moment or the idea. So things like the, the actually, yes, the wing and mobiles are also sculptures. <laughs> Thinking about it, they're also prints and they're also paintings and they're also sculptures. So I think, you know, there's just so much going on that it's actually can be really hard to define those delineations um, that's kind of embedded in the, in the question around that. Um, there is a question, how does the swing work? Is it stationary or bolted to the floor? So the swing has is not bolted to the floor. We actually can't bolt into the floors at the Tang, um, but it has about 500 pounds of lead stage weights on it. So we borrowed stage weights from Skidmore's theater department and bolted those onto the edge and were in consultation with an engineer um, about that for obviously safety reasons. And it created this really great effect in terms of the ways in which we're gonna weigh down the swing because because those um, stage weights that run along the the kind of the swings runners uh, actually kind of resemble the railroad tiles that they walk across every day in Carrizozo, which um, which was a nice kind of serendipitous connection. Um, a question about: Is it common for artists to have so much interaction with the way their works are exhibited, interacted with? Um, I'm not totally sure if you mean the way visitors interact or the way we as a museum work with the artists, but I can answer both. I think that Paula um, definitely prioritizes um, visitor 
experience in a way, like she's really thinking deeply about how somebody will engage with her work and offering um, unusual opportunities and ways to do that. And as a, as a curator, when I'm working with an artist um, for any kind of, especially solo presentation, it's always a very deep and robust um, collaboration. So definitely involved in together, we're involved in, you know, really every, every step of the, of the process as a team. Yeah. Um, I saw there's a question in the chat. What is happening to the large piece Paula made for the Tang? Paula owns that work. Um, so unfortunately, it will not be able to travel to the California African American Museum. Their ceilings are a little lower than ours. Um, but uh, hopefully it'll it'll go somewhere else and be able to be seen uh, elsewhere at, at some point. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll have to see it's sort of the the trouble I guess with um things that are site specific is is kind of what happens to them next in life Okay, so um, I don't know that there is any other questions. So thank you everybody again for coming to this talk. Please come visit Saratoga if you can, or um, if you're near LA, again, that show will go to the California African American Museum opening in April, um, which uh, we're really excited about. So yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Take care.